Welcome to the Lambers Enrolled Agent Review Course. My name is Arthur Reed, and what I'm going to be doing for the next hour is walking you through some of the tax law changes that took place from the 2006 to the 2007 year. I'm doing this for two reasons. One, so that you can have some of the highlights before you begin your review, and also in case you're reviewing the tapes that we made for the 2006 year, which didn't incorporate the 2007 changes yet, prior to us retaping it, you have a good basis for your review, so you know what some of the changes are. I want to talk a little bit about that in case that's the mode that you're currently in. I've been teaching the Enrolled Agent Review course for a number of years and one of the things that I have found consistently is that when the examiners test you on the exam, they're not usually testing you on percentages, on rates, on threshold amounts, on minor tax changes which are indexed each and every year. They tend to be testing you on some very, very broad concepts which have underlying importance in taxation. For example, who qualifies as a dependent? There are many tests on what qualifies a person as a dependent. One of them does focus on how much is the exemption amount, but the bulk of it focuses on other issues as well. There are many questions that come pertaining to new tax laws that have never been enacted before and the examiners like to test you on that as well, which falls into a different category. And so as I look at all the material that we presented in part one, which dealt with 11 chapters of material um, with, with hundreds of questions, there were literally only one or two questions that I had to modify to take into consideration what the 07 tax law was when pertaining to the 06 tax rules. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you now some of those changes for 07 in case you see them on the exam. Because the exam is non-disclosed, we are in a situation where we don't know exactly what you're going to be tested on the exam, but they certainly could deal with some of these highlights. But I want to share with you a little bit of secret as we go through this. When I go through and do an update like this, and as I'm going through now and updating the, the material that I'll be using as we retape this later on, is I need to go to a lot of different resources to find out what some of the tax law changes are. And there are many of them. But there's one publication that I use very heavily, which is available to you, and I'm going to request that you do it. It's an IRS publication. You can go online at www.irs.gov, and you can find this publication. It's publication number 553. And that publication, I've just got it up here so you can actually see it. This one, it has a bit of a misnomer, actually. It says, Publication 583, published in March of 07. And really, it says the highlights of the 2006 tax changes, but it's actually 2006 and 2007. And so what this does is it provides you with what has happened and what is new in those years. But that's the publication number, even though when you go to print it, because we just printed it today, it still says 2006 on it. So that's one document that I look at. A second document that I look at is when I go to a specific form, and I'll give you an example. One form which is a very prevalent form in, in areas of uh, taxation is Form 4562 for depreciation. I'll actually be talking about this a little bit as we get into this chapter later on. But on each form, what they do in the very opening box is they put in a provision that's called what's new. Very similar to the highlights of the tax change, but now it's what's new as it's related to depreciation. And they say four years beginning in 2007. And they'll tell you things here and they'll tell you some things here and there. I'll be honest, I, when I go through the what's new area, some things are really important. I think this has exam significance. But some of the stuff down here I don't think has exam significance. But it gives you a great opportunity to see what's new on the specific forms. Uh, in the filing matters area, we deal with who is the taxpayer what is the dependent, things like that that are important for understanding some very general provisions that pertain to the filing process. One of the things I want to talk about first of all are items that get indexed each year. One of them is referred to as a standard deduction. A taxpayer in filing the tax return is entitled to claim either an itemized deductions by filing a Schedule A or claiming the standard deduction. From 2006 to 2007 these numbers have been indexed up so if you're single and you file a tax return and you do not itemize your deduction but claim a standard deduction, the amount in 2006 was $5,150. In 2007, it jumps up to $5,350. So that amount has been changed. You'll notice that a married filing jointly was in 2006 at $10,300, has jumped to $10,700. And if you do notice the, the interplay between single and married filing jointly, the married filing jointly is twice the, the single amount. And then I'll just go over the 2007 with you. Married filing separately, the standard deduction is 5350 
the head of household is 7850 and the surviving spouse being the same as married finally jointly is 10700 those numbers may become important if you have a problem where a taxpayer has some itemized deductions and then has to determine whether or not it's large enough to claim an itemized deduction or whether or not they should take a standard deduction. It's also important for another topic upon who is required to file a tax return, and I'll get to that one in just a second. Another topic that has changed in it is the amount of the additional standard deduction. This is for a taxpayer who's 65 years or older or blind. And what happens is that if you're a single taxpayer or a head of household, the additional standard deduction that you got in 2006 was 1,250. In 2007, it's been bumped up a little bit to 1,300. And if you're married, file a joint return, surviving spouse, et cetera, your amount has been bumped up to 1,050. So an elderly taxpayer or a blind taxpayer, just in some very general terms, gets not only the basic standard deduction, which was the preceding screen, but also the additional standard deduction as well. Another amount that got indexed up is the amount of the exemption amount. The exemption amount is that when you claim a personal exemption for yourself or a dependency exemption for a dependent child, perhaps, the amount went from $3,300 up to $3,400. Now, that's a number that I think you'd probably see on an exam because sometimes when you're looking at who qualifies as a dependent, they'll say if the gross income of that person, say it's a, a, an unmarried child age 30, it needs to be less than the exemption amount, which is $3,400. So it's something that we'd like to lock in. Now these two items come together to then ask the question of how do you determine whether or not a taxpayer has to file. You take a look at what they qualify for a standard deduction as well as an exemption amount and maybe a basic deduction, uh, the, the additional standard deduction as well. And you combine those two together to make that determination. What I've done is I've pulled a question from a past exam up on the screen so you can see it. And what this basically asks is here's a taxpayer who says John is single, is age 30. He is not the dependent of another taxpayer, that means he can claim himself, and he has gross income of $8,000. Is John required to file a tax return? Well, that's going to be based upon John's standard deduction as well as his personal exemption. Well, we do know that from looking at the slides just previously that the standard deduction for this taxpayer is $5,350, and the personal exemption is $3,400. Therefore, the threshold limitation is $8,750. So if someone has gross income of $8,000, they would not be required to file. 